Welcome to the Mad Ones. I'm here. It would be great if fewer people would ask me if I had cancer. I did this on purpose. My head is bald <laughs> on purpose. Host, Cam Harless. And with me, as always, is your garden-loving halfling hostess, Miss Jessica Green. How are you doing, Jessica? You, I'm good. How do you do? We're, we're recording early, so that means yeah. you may have more energy rather than less, but I'm not I'm not sure how you're... I don't know. Um, the trees <laughs> in my area are all trying to murder me right now. Um, it's allergy season in Georgia, which means everything is puffy and I can't, um, <laughs> you can probably hear in my voice that I can't talk super well right now. So I'm going to do my best to truck through and, um, stay indoors today Yeah, because that's a good WTF idea. nature, <laughs> <laughs> nature has fallen. We have yes. to forget her. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, for, for those that are watching, this show is 100% brought to you by fans and patrons. So hit like, subscribe, share the show with your friends. We've got all sorts of topics we've covered. So share them with someone who may gain something from them. Um, if you are a patron, you may be or can watch this early since we're recording early today. Uh, so if you're not, then you're, you're watching this on Wednesday and it's not during the day. And Jessica has less energy now. And what are you doing? <laughs> um, so if you want the occasional early episode, a Zoom hangout party, which we need to set up one for this month, where we play games together, um, and my eternal gratitude, uh, patreon.com slash the mad ones. Also, if you want a shirt or a mug or something to show off that you watch us losers every week, you can do that at wearethemadones.com slash store. And with oh, your we eternal gratitude um, from Cam, you are purchasing in the afterlife. He has to help you move every time. <laughs> I'll so have a truck. I'll have a truck right. in the afterlife. So, so just, should, you know, yeah. <laughs> make an investment into your future. <laughs> uh, all right. So we have a guest I'm excited to talk about, uh, not talk about, talk to today. And so I'll go ahead and introduce him. Um, if you've ever listened to the City Harmonic, you may have heard this man's voice for her before. Joining us tonight is a musician, an artist, a thinker, a speaker, a believer, and a worship leader. He's also a content creator, and all of his TikToks look fantastic. They look they look like he knows what he's doing with a camera and a lighting setup. Um, he helped mm -hmm. found the City Harmonic with a vision of unity and beauty in the church. Is uh, and he's just great. He has great takes on TikTok about worship culture and Christianity. And so I'm stoked to talk to him, Mr. Elias Stummer. How are hey, you doing? Hey guys, how you doing? <laughs> we <laughs> talked a little bit before. Um, which made me just that much more excited to talk to you because I feel like, like I said, we're kind of in the same zone theologically, yeah. which is so cool. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to point out the name of the episode again, because you have a song, uh, cause you're, you're going to be releasing the full EP soon. You've been releasing I, singles. Yeah. Full LP actually. Yeah. LP. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was an, awesome. Uh, but you've been releasing some, some, uh, singles and mm -hmm. one of them is called the gospel is rest which put my mind through all these different things I've been reading and listening, listening to. And one of them was a um, rabbi Abraham Herschel wrote a piece about the Sabbath and about how um, we have man lives in these spaces and we create temples. And if you look at the temple uh, or the tabernacle and you look at how it was structured, which all seems very boring when you're reading the Bible, right, right. but you'll notice uh, fruit trees and animals and all these other things, it's like a recreation of Eden. It's a recreation of the cosmic temple that was Eden. In the yeah, totally. Eden. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about how we're very space focused, but that Sabbath is like a cathedral in time. It's a, it's a time set apart for our communion with God, for us to have that same kind of worshipful arena in time. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm monologuing here. That's no, great. Uh, Keep going. But, uh, <laughs> but when Jesus came around, uh, if, you, if you look at the Jewish calendar, there's uh, Sabbaths and then there are uh, the feast days and the holidays. Uh -huh. And then there's the, the year of uh, the year of Sabbath, which mm -hmm. the land rests. And then you have the year of Jubilee, which is like this. It's every 50 years. But all of these have this. They're like practical eschatons. Mm -hmm. So they're practical ways of looking at the end and what mm -hmm. we're looking forward to and our hope, which is living in a complete world, being complete ourselves with God. And so it's this beautiful thing. And so when, to, to put it all into perspective, when you say the gospel is rest in your song, it's spe it, even the title is gospeling. It's speaking a truth, yes. which is that um, we are living in a, when we worship, when we do these things, we're living in a cathedral of time. Absolutely. And I think that's beautiful. 
And so I just wanted to get that out there because that's great. When I saw that, I was like, Oh, this is good. I'm going to like talking to this. Yeah, (laughs) no, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And you know, actually, I think we were talking about it briefly before we started, but that's actually what uh, John H. Walton argues is the difference between Genesis one and two. Yeah. Is that in Genesis one, God is laying out similarly to a temple, a cosmic temple. God is laying out within the ordering of creation order itself. And so there is a sense in which um, we, I mean, obviously, you know, we can look at Genesis 1 and 2 in all kinds of strange ways, but but I think that's a very useful way of saying, hey, God's not doing what we post-enlightenment look back on and think he's doing. He's saying you, materiality, the universe itself is designed to sort of point to God in the same way that a temple is. And in the middle of it is man and man imaging God back into the world, reflecting God's goodness and, and, and love and order back out into creation. And how, how could we not take time and, and make time just as much a, a facet of that image bearing as everything else? Yeah. Well, and, and that's, I, I love, um, I need to get into the book, but I was listening to him talk to um, Tim Mackey and John Collins of the yeah. Bible Project. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were, they, he was talking about how and I, I, people have asked me to do an episode on like evolution versus young earth creationism. And I'm like, but the way I look at Genesis, that's not part of the question. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so like when I'm reading Genesis one and two, I'm reading about the who and about what he did in us in a sense, in our world and order. And I'm not reading a science book. And I think that's like the number one thing. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, that was one of the most, so I, there was a while there where Huffington post was publishing some of my blog pieces. And, uh, one of them was on the Ken Ham versus Bill Nye debate. I put, I should have put debate in scare quotes. Um, (laughs) but the, uh, the, the problem for me seemed really obvious that if you're going to try to set up a conversation First of all, the entire conversation was set up on a premise that I agree with you, where the premise doesn't isn't what the text is doing. We can't yeah. we can't read backwards the scientific method and our understanding of truth and materiality and so on from the Enlightenment. We can't read that backwards into the text. You just can't do that. You can't read it backwards into history. And yeah. so why on earth would we look at a text which makes no claims to be about per se, material fact in the way that we now understand material fact. Why would we ask that of the text? That Now, there are examples where that is the case. The Gospels are a good example where these are eyewitness accounts saying this is what happened, you know? Um, but we don't necessarily get that from Genesis in the same way that we do the Gospel of Luke. And so it's yeah. it, they're different types of books. Well, the thing, my thing with Ken Ham and Bill Nye was Ken Ham tried to set up this debate and then just kept talking about the Bible. And it was this really strange, what are you, what are you doing? Like you're bring a scientist on TV to argue about something that he's never going to agree on as a foundation for the entire conversation. And I, I found it so strange. And I feel like we, we do that a lot. We try to sort of, we ham fistedly approach the text <laughs> with our, with our ideologies and worldviews in hand without saying, Hey, how can we obtain a way of seeing and being in the world um, from this incredible thing that we have in, in Christian tradition and in, in, in the Bible. Yeah, I think John the, um... Walton, speaking of him, just to wrap that part up, yeah. is uh, what's really interesting about his, one of the analogies he used was um, we, we need to listen to the, think about the audience, who the audience was, how they would have heard these texts. Absolutely. And so when we approach Genesis, we approach it po- post enlightenment, uh, with re- we, we want rationality, we want science, we want materialism. Yep. Whereas, so when we're reading, we need to read what they what they were reading it as. So it, it, the, his example was, if you walked an ancient um, an ancient Hebrew into a house and they asked you, um, you know, how was this? How did how did you make this house a home? Or how did how did you make this this <clears throat> home uh, a a one of us would say, well, we 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 called the architect who drew up the plans. Right. We ordered this. We had the contractor do this. We built this house, and to all right. the different things about how the house was built. Whereas the Jew, the the Jewish person, ancient Jewish person, would say, well, uh, this this room we decorated it for our daughter. 
and it's it's a function of the family. It's a function of how things were ordered in relation to the people rather than how it was put together with hammer and nails. Right. And right. so that that little d- distinction is so like so, was so helpful for me. Oh but, yeah. Jessica, go Absolutely. ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um I was going to say in terms of the evolution debate, one of the best things a college pref- professor ever did for me was to force me to debate from the other side of the evolution argument. Um, when I was in college, I was a very, uh, you know, pretty militant, secular atheist. Um, what a lot of people today would term an online atheist. That I was every bit that in all, every sense of the word. So the idea that I would have to sort of argue against evolution was I was mad for a week when I was assigned to do that, like just m- mad straight for a week. But being forced to argue effectively for a thing that you don't agree with mm-hmm. is an incredible proving bro- ground for your own arguments. Mm-hmm. And I, I would urge anybody to do that, like really to take the other side as it's most honest and argue for it most effectively. Mm-hmm. And if you can steel man against your own arguments and they still hold up, then they're valuable and there's right. something worth holding on to. But for me, the more I did that, I actually started to find a lot of holes mm-hmm. in some of the way, not necessarily that the idea that, you know, animals change throughout time, but the way that the scientific community accepts yes. these ideas. Yeah, I totally and, agree. Totally agree. Yeah, I, so, I I have no actual problem with evolution as a broad concept or, or even just in terms of age of the earth. I'm not a young earth creationist. Um, so, so I'm a creationist, but just not concerned with exactly when, and it seems if we look at the world as it is, there are all kinds of arguments for material change in humans and so on. And so I, I think we, if we, you know, but you're right, the way that the scientific community approaches its own work is a, is a big part of the gap. It's sort of an inability or unwillingness to intersect with philosophy is the one that's the most prominent to me. Um, and the sort of division of, and this one is really interesting to me, um, the division or breaking out of religion from philosophical studies mm-hmm. as being utterly distinct is really remarkable and new in history. So there's, you know, and I think most people who engage in this have no idea that that's a new conviction that we should treat right the idea that there's something beyond the answers we have as being categorically different from the practice of philosophy itself. And, you know, I mean, even if you look at, uh, the, the sciences, I mean, there are multiple different ways to even approach that. Um, I think of kind of, Oh, what's his name? I'm blanking on it now. And I talk about it all the time, but, uh, the scientific philosopher talking about the idea that science can only prove what we don't know, what we know not to be true. Um, so there's, there's, that's, you know, very different than uh, science in public, where you have sort of this PR angle where science has, in essence, become an, a, a replacement for the priesthood of old, where they're looked to to have concrete answers that, by definition, science cannot produce. Correct. Right. And yeah. and cool. that that is a fascinating problem for me. And COVID is a great example of watching that play out, watching science happen in public and watching the public look to the priesthood for answers and this, the priesthood is doing what scientists do, changing the answers all the time yep. as evidence arises. And right. it's just this total disconnect of kind of what humans innately want the priesthood to do and what scientists are able to offer. Yes. And we have a huge philosophical gap. Well, also, I also think it, that there's a problem with how we view science as like a culture. Mm -hmm. Because we use the word science, I think, a lot of people in place of the word God in a a big way. Or truth, even, if you wanted to. Yeah, that too. Um, But it's it's, it's wild because, you know, people say believe science. And it seems like a lot of the people I talk to don't realize that science in its essence is just our understanding of what we're seeing. That's right. It's not exhaustive. It's not it changes. It's not trustworthy in the same way as we would view something external. I would, I would go a little further than that and say it's that it's not meant to do that at all. It's meant to be a tool, right? much right. like a, a hammer, a wrench, or a ruler, right. or yep. a combination of those things. Exactly. And yeah. so it can't be that. 
it's that's like right. by its nature cannot function that yeah. way. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's what I, I remember. That's what Pop, Popper, Carl Popper is who I was talking about. Mm -hmm. See, he, that's his kind of argument, right? And he's, I, he, like me, I'm very pro science. Mm -hmm. I mean, a big chunk of what I've come to has come partly from the text and saying, hey, there are big gaps between practice and what seems to make sense when you read church history and you read, you know, what, what was, and for me, working in ecumenical circles influenced that in a big way. But I, I got super involved in, I mean, I, I own a marketing agency I have for 15 years. We've worked with all kinds of big companies and I work as a consultant. And if you're in that space, neuroscience is a must as an am, as a, a minimally an amateur interest. So it's like, I, I have to be interested in how do we choose things? How do we decide things? How do we, and that has been extremely useful for me as a person who cares about the human condition and faith and, and, and Christ in my life, um, and has had huge implications for how I view worship. Um, yeah. and as an artist, that's made me a little bit of an oddball in the worship music space. I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, and. Part, there's a host of reasons for that, but but just being interested and comfortable with the role that science and what we what we can or are starting to know about the human brain and personality and consciousness and you know which we have more questions than answers in the science world, of course. Yeah. But 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 nevertheless, what we are starting <clears throat> to know is actually should be reassuring for Christians if only we had our heads on straight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, there are, there are a lot of different things that I want to, I want to hit on with you and, sure. um, worship's definitely one of them. Um, the concept of deconstruction is one of them. Um, but I think that, uh, for those who don't know your work, mm -hmm. I think it would be really good to kind of dig into that, the city harmonic, what you, what, what you've done in the past. Yeah. Would you mind telling us kind of how Absolutely. that happened, Absolutely. Your, your, your history Christianly and with the city harmonic? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I, I grew up at a small, I grew up going to a small Baptist church in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. So that's a steel town that doesn't make steel anymore. Well, it does, but the steel is like Birmingham. Yeah. Where, I mean, the steel industry <laughs> collapsed. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think something like a hundred thousand men, went from being full-time employed to unemployed without college degrees. Oh, so, so, you know, it's a, ci a city mostly known until the last 15 years, really by poverty. So, um, that's what I grew up in. We were pretty poor ourselves. Uh, I was lucky enough to have been, I, I was in the gifted program, uh, from a young age and was moved to these nice schools, even though I was in the ghetto basically. Yeah. So, um, we went to a small Baptist church with a ton of English people in it, a bunch of Anglo Baptists. Uh, and you know, by the time the nineties was coming around, I was a teenager and it was, you know, 1994 when the whole Toronto blessing thing happened at Toronto airport Christian fellowship. And there was a big emphasis on charismatic renewal and, uh, that affected everything in driving distance of Toronto, including my own church and my own youth group. So, I grew up in that. Um, so we were kind of at the, at the threshold of like the worship wars at the threshold of renewal versus non-renewal churches. And those debates were all alive and well in my teen years. And, Can you, yeah. for a person, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but right. I don't know what the worship wars are. Could yeah. You so essentially for a long time, and it kind of remains, although it's petered out um, for a long time, there was a debate between uh, whether or not churches should principally sing hymns from the hymn book or whether churches should adopt a contemporary musical style is okay. really what, really what it comes down to. Gotcha. Um, so, so that was kind of part of what was there. I was leading as a teenager in a church with a guy who would turn off my microphone when I led like that kind of thing. Yeah. It's just very, okay. lot, lots of animosity. Um, right. And so, uh, you know, I was, my faith and life were enriched by modern worship and also enriched by kind of the charismatic renewal movement. Um, but I also saw the good, bad, and ugly where, it, you know, the use of the, the use of an understanding of prophecy in such a way that it was clearly just power mongering and, and, yeah. you know, ego, ego feeding and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I often call it borrowed. I call it borrowed authority. We can talk about that later. Um, okay. but, but 
I, in that, including someone who's really, really dear to my life, my own youth pastor ended up being a person who practiced spiritual gifts in a really expressive outward way, um, constantly borrowing authority. And then it turned out years later to, to have been really hypocritical in his life. Um, and his, he kind of had a major crisis and, and it was one of those strange things where I was like, I'm pretty sure whatever the spiritual gifts are, that they aren't like a trick that we can use for good and evil. I don't think that's quite how that works, you know? Um, yeah. so anyway, uh, so that kind of happened and, and Hamilton being a city that was poor with all of this happening was sort of the perfect, uh, formation or soil for a, a pretty incredible ecumenical movement. So a couple of pastors, that means interdenominational. Um, okay. So a couple of pastors started working together uh, from different denominations, praying together. And then they just said, well, what would it look like if we prayed together? What would it look like if our churches did ministry together in some way? And then that ballooned into 30 plus churches uh, working together for the good of Hamilton, launching parish, launching interchurch ministries together, doing mission together and investing in neighborhoods that City Hall had abandoned to the point where in the span of 15 years, now while the, the church can't take sole credit for this, but in the span of 15 years, Hamilton went from being uh, from having the poorest urban neighborhood in the country to being one of the top real estate investment cities in the country. And so now they're dealing with gentrification. Right. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a totally different, like, so it was remarkable to me that I grew up in the midst of unity, literally working, like having a functional benefit for the entire city. Um, and so when I was about 22, 23 years old, uh, I started a ministry that was sort of the student arm of that, where we would get kids together from all the different college and high school groups across the city. Uh, they would come together in the morning, quick kumbaya. We'd organize them into groups and send them out to serve all across the city. They'd work in homeless shelters. They'd pick up needles at the skate park. And I don't mean pine needles. Um, and then they would come back at the end of the day and we'd have a big kind of raucous worship night and share testimonies and stories of what we'd seen happening in through mission throughout the city. Yeah. Uh, very, very close tie to social justice as a, as a, as a broad idea. Um, and the city harmonic was the house band for that. So we were all from different churches. Uh, we were leading a mission and worship movement. Um, and then one thing led to another and we found ourselves which is a long story, found ourselves with a record deal. And that's what the song manifesto, which is probably the one people would know, um, was about. It was inspired by the creeds and the Lord's prayer. These two unifying things that, you know, somewhere between 500 to a thousand kids can scream at the top of their lungs and say, we stand on this common ground. So that's, that's what it was. Um, right, right. and so we soon found ourselves touring and doing that, uh, by, by our, but within a year or two of touring, uh, Eric, our bass player, had leukemia and was off the road for two years. Um, and we were, for a minute, one of the biggest bands in Christian music. So it's sort of this weird thing of traveling the world and playing arenas while our friend is fighting for his life and we're kind of helping him cover his costs. Um, once he was better, he came back. We spent most of 2015 uh, traveling the U.S. trying to initiate roundtable conversations similar to what we'd experienced back home. We made a movie about Hamilton and the story of what unity had done for our city called we are the city harmonic. Uh, and we lost a lot of money doing that and I'm grateful for it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, came out the end of that saying, Hey, if this is the thing that breaks us, so be it. It was worth it. Uh, but at that point, the end of that year, Eric realized he couldn't tour anymore, um, for health reasons. And we sort of said, you know what, M maybe we need to, about a year after that, we sort of decided to close the book ourselves Rather than have seasons six through seven, nine of The Office, we stopped after four. I got you. I was, I was, I was, I thought you were going to go with Received. a, uh, with a um, Game of Thrones reference. Like yeah, it should yeah. have ended after season seven. Yeah, yeah, it's same, same, same concept, yeah. same concept. So, we, so we we ended the book ourselves, and then my drummer, we ended it ended really well. We're friends. The guys were really encouraging to me. Um, Josh in particular was like, dude, you need to do a solo record and do it right now. So I took a couple of years and worked on that. Um, and now I'm working on my second solo record after having been through seven years of helping to plant a church. And I'm not at that church now, but you know, it, they've got a good thing going. Um, but it's been, yeah, a, a lot of stuff in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say quickly, Curie Elision is yeah. a flat-out banger. 
Oh, thanks, man. It, it, it inspired a tweet today as well. So I mean, oh, you, you're, awesome. you're, you're doing, you're doing some good stuff. Awesome. What I thought was funny is on your, um, I believe, it, I believe in your bios, you call yourself an Anglicostal, which yeah. I think is funny because there are these little um, bits that seem to, we have similarities because I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, which was called the magic city because it was, it had the ironworks of steel production and it went from not being much of a city to a huge city. Like, oh overnight. yeah. Yeah. That's what I called it. The magic city. Cause it sprung out, uh, sprung out, out of nowhere. Right. Um, but that's, and I grew up in a church that used to be Baptist that became charismatic. And so mm. the joke, my whole life has been, we're Baptocostal. Yes. Yeah. So, so very, very similar. I just, I just found that. That's hilarious. I was like, yeah. I was like, this is, this is similar. That's funny. Um, but no, I think, I, I think what uh, like your TikToks are great. I do want to stress that like, seriously, the production value you put in that is great. Like you, you it looks good. And most Thanks, people man. can't say that. It's like what I, uh, I have a friend, one of our uh, viewers, watchers, subscribers. Um, he, he go he says, you know, the only podcast I watch is yours because uh, no one else actually makes a good intro video. <laughs> <laughs> You actually do some work. I'm like, That's yeah, amazing. <laughs> um, but no, it's uh, one of the things that initially drew me to you was the first TikTok that I saw of yours is you were kind of shortly commenting on the, there was a Hillsong documentary, <clears throat> excuse me, that came out not that long ago, which I, so for those who don't know, Hillsong was a church out of um, Australia. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't called Hillsong at first. It was called like, I forget, it was some generic church name. Yep. And then their their worship ministry was called Hillsong. And Darlene Zetch, it, I, that's her last name, right? Is that yep. Zetch? Zetch? Yeah. Am I, I think um, it's Czech. Czech? Okay, yeah. yeah. I've heard people I, say I it so wrong. many different ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, she was like, an, she used to be an actress and all of this. And they had this r- really big... 90s sounding worship music that went all around the world because what they were doing was instead of just playing the normal hymns or playing things that you knew they all of their songs were written within the zeitgeist so Mm -hmm. it was they were songs and rock is essentially rock music or pop music of that time but in a worship worship songs that are more like the current population what they prefer and so that went everywhere the church exploded and then in this this Hillsong documentary, they had um, they had a church. I'm sure they still do in New York. Mm-hmm. And the the biggest and they have churches everywhere. Yeah, they. I, I think that some of them have split off now after the documentary. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, because I I, I I I there's one that's kind of close to where we live, and I didn't see the word Hillsong on it when I drove past it. Well, they time. have a they have a church planting network that is broader than the brand itself. They started to do that about five six years ago. Yeah, because it used to say Hillsong Church, and now it doesn't. Oh, I was like, yeah. Oh, I is wonder that, if they is that split. Wave or oh, I forget what it's called. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it, it's in Central Florida. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the the there was a big star within Hillsong New York, which was the pastor Carl Lentz, mm-hmm. and he was like Justin Bieber's pastor, and he was a lot of stars pastors, and he would be on TV, and he got caught up on the Instagram as uh, preachers with sneakers because he would be wearing exorbitantly expensive clothes and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> but the, the documentary, I, I watched two episodes of it cause I, I just got sad about that, that far into it. Yeah. Um, because I'll be honest, when I saw Carl Lentz initially, I had reservations mm-hmm. about him. And yeah. so when I saw this, I, I always, that's what's, that's what made me sad is I hate when my reservations are correct. Right. And he had, um, he had done some uh, extramarital affairs and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And there was a lot of, I, I didn't get past that. So I don't know if there was worse stuff out of Australia or anything like that. I don't know. No. There, well, that's actually really the biggest issue is that um, that documentary to me, like there was a few comments made that I can understand why people make them, but it sort of seemed thoughtless. And a lot of the first two episodes consisted of those. And then the yeah. real meat of why that documentary exists at all is in the third episode. Okay, where, so I need to keep going. Mm-hmm, <laughs> where, where, and this, the, the real trouble legally is all about the third episode. So okay. um, there is essentially, it, it appears that Brian Houston's father uh, had abused some children and it was a known thing within the church and essentially hush money was given and 
all this kind of stuff. And that's, and that's where I, that's why I got sad, I think, cause I felt that that's where it was heading. Which, which and, really, it seems like it was a one episode documentary that, that I forget who made it. Uh, I can't remember the, the network discovery. discovery. Um, so I think discovery, my guess is they ordered three episodes and stretched it. It could have been yeah. a two hour movie and they turned it into a three hour mini series because there was stuff in there that you could point at literally any organization. Take volunteering, for example, Hillsong, have they had complicated relationships between money and volunteers? Maybe. Um, but they've also literally created careers by doing so. And so that's, it, and at the same time, the idea that churches should pay everyone who lifts chairs and stuff like, is just ridiculous. I mean, that's just, yeah. that, 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 that's a thoughtless critique. And the, the thing comment I was making on TikTok was, was about one of those where the, in, the, essentially it was phrased that, um, and there are, there, I just wish they'd actually teased this out because it is an interesting conversation and they didn't have it on the documentary, which, which is, which is that like, okay, the relationship between music and emotion, they were saying, um, the, you think it's the Holy spirit. Well, Hill songs, no, they're manipulating you with these chord right. structures. And I'm like, well, that's, that's all chord structures. Music is inherently emotionally manipulative. The, it, it's that's, yeah. and that's, that's actually not, that's neutral. That's just music yeah. is an emotional tool, period. Right. Anytime we use it, that's what it's accomplishing. And, and so we can argue that that's good or bad. And the word manipulation I only used because they used it and I thought it was cute to do so. But like, <laughs> it is a word that we use to essentially attribute intent to yeah. the person on the other side of thing, which we, the vast majority of the time are not in a position to do. So yeah. we have, we have no idea that when Brooke Lichterwood writes a Hill songs. In fact, I'm fairly confident Brooke means well by everything she's doing. And, and in the midst of that, because she's affiliated with Hillsong, we get this angle of like, Oh, maybe she's the, the institution is just doing this to fill coffers. That's a, that's a bit overly simplistic, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so my, my argument wasn't necessarily pro or against Hillsong. It was this documentary is frustrating because there are very real issues that deal with very prominent issues within evangelicalism, which is yeah. we have a leadership culture problem that is very significant. And we have a strange relationship I, again with the kind of borrowed authority thing to attributing all of our physiological sensations to the Holy spirit as distinct from our physiological sensations, which mm. leads to deconstruction in my opinion, which leads to people. And, and, I, and by the way, I, I mean, deconstruction in the sense of people who are not well equipped or even people who just, it seeds, sows of sows seeds of doubt in a way that are problematic. If people are not equipped to have these conversations or don't have people around right. them who can help them explore these questions meaningfully. And so the issue isn't that they use chord structures that are manipulative because all songs do that. The issue is that they said, every time you feel this, that's God breaking through the material barrier and giving you this physiological sensation. Well, what happens when they go to Counting Crows or Coldplay and they have the exact same sensation? Right. They're, they're led to, oh, this, this must be a lie. And, and it, right. it, because they're taking sort of a problematic starting point for granted. Well, the documentary explored none of that. And on, and on top of that, the lady who they positioned as an expert on Pentecostalism said that tried to say that tongues were foretold in scripture as being this future minded thing. And I was like, that's not even, that's not <laughs> even in the Bible. Like this yeah. supposed expert is like, we, people debate whether or not it was then or now, but nobody's thinking this is something for later. That's not right. ever, you know, right. It, it even just, says they will cease. When yeah. That which is perfect comes. So it's like, it was, it was a total asinine <laughs> comment. And I, and I thought this is the expert. And, and like any, <laughs> So the problem for me is like the opportunity of a documentary like that is to, is for people who are say warm towards an organization like Hillsong and to say, Hey, what is it that we're propping up? Whether it's Mars Hill or Hillsong or any of these other institutions, what is it that we're propping up and looking past really horrible things because it makes us feel good. And, the, and right. this documentary wasted all of its chances to do so by burning its credibility for the first episode and a half. Right. Well, and it's like, it's speaking of uh, Mars Hill was another, there was a podcast. What was the name of the podcast? 
Oh, the rise and uh, fall of Mars Hill. The rise yeah. and fall of Mars Hill, which I've been listening to some as well. And it's just, it there did there does seem to be this uptick in kind of anti-evangelical. Well, I'll say content. that podcast not, was well done, actually. Right, I'm, and I'm not I'm not yeah. saying they were anti-evangelical, but like it it <clears> seems <throat> like when you, what you're talking about with the, um, you know the the way your your body reacts to music, regardless of which way or the other. I think that it's interesting because it i keep running into these like binary choices that are not at all binary mm -hmm. it's like there's this lack of a holistic understanding of the human being yep and i think and even in the i'm disconnected to the human being but there's also a a lack of that within theology a lot of times mm -hmm. because or, or I, politics right and mm -hmm. i I've, I've stopped arguing with people mm -hmm. like years ago on i wish i case. could <laughs> i've gotten very hard. i, I, I it's, it wasn't hard for me because as soon as I stopped and I started talking to the people who actually wanted to talk to me and having discussions with people that wanted to discuss things with me, I realized I was much happier. Yeah. Like I, I don't I have, that. Yeah. I don't, I don't have to fight every Tom, Dick or Harry out there. Who's angry about something, but I can have genuinely good conversations with people when I decide to. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. I get that completely. <laughs> um, but that's what that's, that's kind of part of the reason why I wanted to have you on is because I keep having these conversations that either I don't fully have because I know that it'll lead to an argument. Um, because even if I come at it in a way that is um, amiable and I'm trying to be kind and have a discussion, it seems that there's too much fire mm. mm -hmm. on either mm -hmm. side, typically that entering yeah. into that conversation is nearly impossible. But there's a lot of talk in the last several years that's disparaging uh, worship music as the, this, these are just rock shows. Uh, right. They have laser lights. I don't want to go in there or right. this, that, or the other. And it's, it's really been a difficult place for me because I, I didn't, I wasn't part of the music group, but when I was in college, I toured the country with a praise and worship band that we did different uh, youth camps and people, when they talk about this, they speak in it in so broad a way that my friend, Josh, who is the closest to Jesus I've ever met a person in my life. And I don't, I don't mean that in some kind of weird way. I'm just saying he was easily the most humble yeah. and the most, the person who I, if, if anyone had a connection to Jesus and he fully integrated it into his life holistically, it that's the him. person yeah. that I would point to. And they would put him who wrote these simple songs based off of hymns or Psalms. And they would put him in the same basket as, I mean, I guess Hillsong, which is the the way that they they ha they hated on Hillsong because it's right. just a rock and roll show. It's just to sell you merch. It's not, right. it's not, you know, spiritual or religious yeah. or anything. It's just that. Yeah. And so I I was like, I want to talk to this about. I want to talk about this with yeah. Elias because he's been in this place. Oh yeah. And yeah. And time. you know, and me and me and Jessica are in different areas of Christianity because, like I said, I I I told you this offline, but I you know I grew up charismatic and I'm still in the charismatic sphere, um, but I'm kind of church homeless right now. Mm -hmm. And I have been looking into Anglicanism and my wife has been looking into the Eastern Orthodoxy and stuff like that. But I've been on this, um, I, I don't like using the word deconstruction, which I'd like to hit on yeah, that. We'll, like we'll get there. Your TikTok. But I, I, I've, I've deconstructed certain aspects of, or idi certain idiosyncr idiosyncrasies of my own mm -hmm. uh, Tradition, background. Yeah that I go, oh, well, I don't see that in the Bible and I, I shift. Right. And so it's, mm -hmm. it, I'm in a weird way. Oh dude. Um, I think that's a lot of us. I think uh, so. Yeah. NT, NT writes a, a guy I'm very fond of. Um, yeah. He talks about a uh, heresy and this is a really useful metaphor. I think um, he, there's two hair, there's two sort of uh, axioms that he sort of, well, not axioms, but two things he say that side by side make a lot of sense. One is that heresy tends to be, if you think about, the truth, if you will, like an audio mixer, right? Heresy is just like you get a bad mix. If all you have is kick drum, heresy is what you have. If one thing is way too loud, it might be true. It might be true when it's in with everything else and in its right place. But if you crank it all the way up, then you end up with something where it distorts the perception of the whole. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's an interesting way to look at how we approach these things in terms of truth on the, on the other hand of heresy, you know, um, his, his other comment with this is that like, even as a theologian, theologian as studies as he is, 
he sort of says, hey, the thing is, I know that I'm wrong about at least 30% of what I believe. The trouble is, I don't know which 30. <laughs> Unknown unknowns. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, that's, I think, the sort of humility we need to be bringing to these conversations, whether it's with brothers and sisters in the faith or whether it's with people outside the church. And we're just not doing that at all. Yeah. Um, well, and, and it's something as a Canadian, I've noticed an interesting phenomenon in the U S where I'm granted a position to say things that Americans are not allowed to say to each other. Hmm. Interesting. So, and, and I'm why are, why are foreign pastors so beloved in America, even for like, why are accents an automatic license for a pastorship in certain circles, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. there's a certain political binary that is the sphere that is dominant in the u.s over top of all thinking and it is like you're you're here or you're there whereas if 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 i can attribute to you that you aren't here or there then i'm gonna at least treat i'm gonna be more kind towards what you're saying than what they're saying right and and i feel like that that bleeds into all kinds of spheres of life where i'm I'm noticed. I'm. I don't think I'm being that much nicer than other American speakers <laughs> saying the same things. But I'm being given all kinds of graciousness as I do it. And I think on some level, it's because they're like, "Oh, it's cute. The non-American is talking." <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, it's funny is as as an American who uh, I don't I don't subscribe to the political binary. I don't yeah. I don't like politics. I I am all about that actual king jesus that's 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 what, yeah. where my life is stationed so it's like i'm not interested in a lot of this stuff but um and it, but so when i'm having conversations where i've changed my mind on how i've read the bible about hell and i, I feel like that the the way we all talk about it mm -hmm. is more dante than than bible mm -hmm. then i get crapped on rather than listened to and so yep. i just maybe i just need like an australian accent yeah you could just fake just pick up an accent <laughs> somewhere and come back and they'll be like oh this is remarkable yeah well um, isn't it isn't it something that jesus said himself that prophets are never appreciated in their own hometowns yeah so. i definitely yeah <laughs> definitely and especially in a country that loves the idea that it's at war with itself oh wow. definitely yeah so I, I, you know it's kind of you nailed in. it <laughs> yeah. Um, so w when you've um, worked in the worship scene, mm -hmm. I mean, how have you reacted to people who um, kind of disparage what you do maybe as rock and roll rather than actual worship? No, I, it is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> right. No, False yeah, binary. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, I, th I think I think the thing is like people. I, I like to tease with questions and I don't mean tease in a mean way. I mean, I like to Socratic. Yeah. What do you mean by that? And then what do you mean by, and not just for the sake of being annoying, but actually trying to get past and that deconstruction is a good example of this, but I, I think we, we tend to use loaded terminology. Worship leaders do this to each other with the word performance, um, like crazy actually. Um, and, and it's crazy making, it gives people all kinds of anxiety about it. And, and it's very often the case. So there's a, just to, so before I answer the question, not to be a politician okay. about it. Um, there's a <laughs> marketing guru, uh, named Seth Godin, and he talks about how a lot of human behavior and sociologically, and in terms of behavioral economics, how do you get people to buy a thing, um, mm -hmm. is boiled down to one simple sentence. And it's the sentence that groups of people often operate from and individuals do without seeing it. Uh, although, yeah, anyway, it's people like us do things like this. Mm. Ah. It is so often the case that our arguments have less to do with well-reasoned thought and more to do with who, to whom we think we belong and what we think that person is like. Okay. So it is so often the case that people come to me and they'll say something with using loaded words like deconstruction. John Cooper is a good example of this. What is he okay. accomplishing in his speeches about deconstruction? Practically nothing. He's rallying a bunch of Christians and looking really angry on the internet and changing no one's mind about anything, right? Yeah. He's got his reward, as Jesus would say, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but the, at, at, in the same way, like people coming at me with conversations about performance or worship, or there are legitimate concerns in there, but I would say less than 5% of the people I've spoken to on this subject have them. It is more often two, three questions in, 
it becomes clear they they haven't really they don't know quite why they're saying this, but they know they feel it, and so they they have this there's this sort of apprehension towards what's happening. Um, for me, though, uh, the answer really comes down to aesthetics most of the time, um, and then how we moralize those aesthetics. And so, your average Protestant holds an incoherent worldview in their relationship to tradition. And so they think that they are holding up something, and I see Jessica smiling. Um, they 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 think that <laughs> I didn't they say are, it. <laughs> yeah they they think that they are holding up the Bible, which says very little, practically nothing, about what corporate worship should be like. And so if we look at, I mean, even the formation of scripture is a traditional element, but if you if you look at the Bible and you say I'm going to get worship from the Bible, you're going to struggle. Yeah. It's not it's not there. And so if it's not there, you have to say, well, what are the principles by which we do this and how do they affect how we're doing that? And to, to that, when, once you start to do that, it becomes clear that while there are theological conversations in it, the difference between stained glass or a simple room or laser light show is a complex question, but it is an aesthetics question. Mm -hmm. it, it, there may be an ethical element to it, but it is simply not in the way that people come at it. Um, yeah. and, and that's not the angle they're coming at it from. They're saying the thing I know, the thing that has felt like the spirit to me my whole life, this doesn't feel like, and that is a physiological question. That's, that's a conversation about nostalgia and emotion and oxytocin and serotonin and dopamine. And no one wants to have that conversation in that regard. And it's like, there's a, a, a phrase uh, you know, uh, what is it talking about me or writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Like it's an <laughs> awkward clunky thing. And I'm, I think we've reached a point in worship and in Christian theology and in our relationship to science and so on and human nature that we have to start dancing about architecture because we have adopted so many positions un uncritically that are incoherent with historic Christianity and incoherent with any of our practices. And we're just kind of doing them all at the same time and hoping it works out. So how does, with you um, deconstructing this concept, how has that looked for you when you're writing worship or when you're writing yeah. songs? Has that has yeah. changed how you do it? Well, there was a book uh, called This Is Your Brain on Music that was written by Daniel Levitin back in the early 2000s. And he's a neuroscientist at McGill who was a rock producer in the 80s. Super rad book. He has another <laughs> book called The World in Six Songs. And these two books I read in the early 2000s, way before anyone heard of City Harmonic. And they fed some of what we were doing with City Harmonic. Okay. So it was, it was literally like structurally... Uh, the sorts of things that we thought were happening in music. It, it's a little bit like Oz behind the curtain, right? Or Penn and Teller in magic, right? There's two ways you can look at it. One, I can say there are mechanisms that I use that when I use these mechanisms, they achieve an end. And which is more moral to know the mechanisms or to pretend the mechanisms don't exist and call it magic. <laughs> and I think that's, often at the heart of what's a problem in this kind of worship conversation. Whereas I'm writing a song, it's like it, people are offended at the idea that I'm like, no, we're going to do these things that are technical things. And in yeah. doing so, we're going to create the experience that we want to experience because I believe when approached prayerfully, that experience is fruitful. Mm -hmm. And and instead we say, well, no, I let's, if the bunny disappears, it's, <laughs> it's magic. There's no pen and teller in worship, right? And I, and I, that, so it, it fueled a lot of what we were doing because, and you've said this earlier, I take for granted at this point in my life, it's been 18 years, a very holistic view of the relationship between God and the world and not a monistic view, but, yeah. but a sort of complex and somewhat mysterious view of how God relates to physical matter and the world and our brains and all and, and so on and so on. I'm not scared of the sciences. I'm not scared of any of it. And I'm happy to say these are tools in the toolbox for us to use as disciple makers, as people who are yeah. shaping people to live more Christ-like lives holistically. And and so that that to me, yeah, it fueled a lot of what we were doing in City Harmonic. It fuels a lot of what I do today. Um, at first it was a little deflating. It 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 was sort of like seeing the curtain, seeing behind the curtain of Oz. Right. And it and Seeing the magic, 
yep, the, the magic was gone. Um, but it was 18 years ago. I'm a lot more comfortable with it now and enjoy it a lot more, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. If I could say, uh, I, when I've, I've only been Christian for roughly two years, been yeah. exploring the concept for three years. Yeah. And when I first started to um, get myself to go to a church in the first place, I went to a mega church that had a rock band playing for the mm -hmm. first 30 minutes mm -hmm. there. That was um, something that I could conceptualize and identify yep. with. Yep. And it brought me to there. If I had had to go from where I was to sitting at an Orthodox church, that would have been a much bigger leap. For yes, me. totally. And so it mm -hmm. absolutely provided a stepping stone where I felt like this is something I can handle, something yep. familiar to me. Totally. That um, brought me into the, even the concept of walking through the doors of a church, having been a secular person my entire life up until that point. Right. And so there is um, a humongous value in that. Oh, I, that I couldn't does, agree more. Right. Especially since we're not the culture of people who some of these original hymns were written for in their time that would have had a very similar effect to them. Right. So, you know, we're looking at it, it through this perspective of anything that's not traditional is by nature evil, heretical, um, in some way um, depletes or dilutes our worship. Totally. When, in fact, you know, you have to meet people where they live, too. Uh, oh, and yeah, there's, there's an absolutely right. missional translation role that the church plays and, and needs to play. And I think what often happens emotionally for Protestants is they don't even realize that the hymns they're singing are any, aren't even as old as them. <laughs> and so like you, there's people acting as if their forefathers wrote a song that they were 10 years old when it was written or that is are three generations, four generations old. I mean, mm -hmm. the Protestantism is a new tradition. Hymn singing is a very new tradition. Mm -hmm. And, and the more we know, the more we can say, Oh, it turns out history is complicated and God is good and real. And we can, we can live with that tension and say, within orthodoxy or within a mm -hmm. Protestant megachurch, God is going to use this in some way. And maybe they are different tools for different purposes and, and so on, different emphases within it. But it's a beautiful family that we belong to. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think there's something really rich in coming at conversations like these or conversations about faith in that way. Um, mm -hmm. But it, that's why I point out that Seth Godin thing, because so often we just reduce into tribalism instead. Yeah. Right. And and it's an emotional tribalism, not a sort of defensible, we believe these things and these are important. It it sometimes that's part of it, but it's not often the reason we react the way we do. I really liked oh. what you had to say, sorry, Cam, about um mechanisms versus magic. Yeah. And um when you were talking about like hymns versus worship songs, I was trying to delineate in my mind, well, what's the real difference there? Because if you go back to the very, very early church in terms of like the chanting, the chanters chanting, mm -hmm. this has the exact same effect that I think that worship songs probably have today. 100%. Is to a, a repetition, a musical repetition, a tonality. I'm not a musical person, so work with me That's here. Great. Um, great. Like t tone yep. lands in the human mind yep. in a certain way that helps us like identify. It's why we remember commercial jingles. Oh, totally. We remember our own phone number. Um, there's you know, there's something about it that helps us implant these stories into ourselves. I so couldn't agree more. Access them as second nature, as opposed to them being some um, far flung thing deep in the tome of a thick book that we'll never read. Oh my gosh. Could I go on a crazy tangent? Do yes. please. Okay. Okay. So, so that book, the world in six songs by Daniel Levitin, he argues in evolutionary and, you know, prehistoric sociological, yeah, archeological terms, uh, that um, it is likely that music, sung music, predates human speech in human history. Wow. Cool. So <laughs> he, he argues this because of our physiological reaction to melody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So some pretty remarkable things happen. I've done videos on these, but I'll share it here because I talk about this all the time. Um, group singing, literally just us singing and hearing others sing with us has a such a profound physiological effect that has been measured produces a wild amount of a hormone called oxytocin. Now oxytocin mm -hmm. is called the love hormone. This is what happens when a mother breastfeeds. 
It's the rush you feel on some level when your elbows touch on your first date at a movie, you know, whatever. It's, okay. it's, it's this sensation which causes us to deepen trust bonds with the people we are with. To um, and, that, and that's at a subconscious but chemical level. Um, and then beyond that, so it deepens social bonds. And it was only just a few years ago that the University of Bonn in Germany showed that oxytocin also increases altruism in humans. Hmm. Ah, I can understand so, that. Yeah. So singing produces all kinds of serotonin and dopamine. It's a happiness thing. It's rewarded. We're supposed to sing. And then when we sing with others, the byproduct is quite literally Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your whole being, which also includes the social sphere if you look at much of the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And then the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We literally deepen our desire and fondness for God and each other in group singing and our desire to self-sacrificially love our neighbor mm -hmm. at a chemical level when we group sing. So there's something that's like, we think of, you know, having the gospel embodied within us as he hearing a sermon, believing that fact, and then acting on that fact. And the truth is very little human behavior works that way. Um, and I can get real weird if you want. Um, oh, that, please do. Yeah. So, <laughs> so neuroscience is in an interesting place right now when it comes to the question of personality and consciousness. Um, having worked in the marketing space for a long time, marketers have known for a very long time that uh, human choice making is A, principally emotional, and B, preliterate. So the actual decision-making process, there's a thing called split brain syndrome, which is where somebody's had a traumatic head injury and the hemispheres of their brain don't talk correctly. Right. Right. In the case of split brain syndrome, people who've had their emotional centers disconnected from their reasonable centers, their rationing personality, can't make choices at all. They can't choose to pick up a spoon. What's even more than that is uh, in, in the same split brain research, uh, they have found that the conscious self, the part you can talk to as a person, right, within the structure of the brain, is much more of an interpreter of circumstances than it is a determiner of circumstances. It's, it's the press secretary, not the president. Ah. So in the same studies where they would have the scientists would say, hey, pick up the spoon, or they would force through electrodes the spoon to grasp, they would say, why did you pick up the spoon? The answer was never because of the electrodes attached to my body and always some made up explanation. Mm -hmm. And so there's a degree to which we grasp at quick explanations for our own behaviors, which are so often intuitive and emotional and pre-conscious. And what's more, the actual decision-making switch that happens in the brain is around eight milliseconds before the language processing centers of our brain. So by the time we are reasoning our choices, they were, they were already made. They happened in the reptilian brain and which is a, a terminology referring to the oldest evolutionary portions of our brain that we share in common with most four legged things and two legged things. Um, that function of our brain decides things and then our reasoning centers explain them later, something like eight to mm -hmm. 10 milliseconds later. So that to me raises fascinating questions for the role of liturgy, fascinating questions for the role of sung worship and prayer. What is it we're fundamentally mm -hmm. doing? Fascinating questions about the relationship between preaching and behavior change. And what is it that leads, what, how do we fill the gap between uh, the question of the fruits of the spirit and the Christ-like life and the questions of the practices that we have and what wisdom do the practices we have share have to share with us that we've overlooked because of our sort of enlightenment take on how things work and how spiritual the role spirituality plays in life. And it seems to me, the more we learn in the sciences about the human, the human question, mm -hmm. the more what we're doing, I'm actually a little bit more of a worship apologist than I am a critic because yeah. it's like actually a lot of our practices make way more sense when you take a, a more holistic view of the of, hu of the human question. Right, right. I was considering that when during my first attendances of Orthodox liturgy, a lot of things are repetition. Mm -hmm. Over the course of the year, you'll come back 
mm-hmm. to the same gospel stories, to the same hymns. Yep. And you'll start to like recognize, oh, you know, this is the time of year for this idea. Yep. And um, despite yourself, you could go sit in the liturgy and barely pay attention to it. Yeah. But it's still going to imprint itself into your brain. So later on, you're doing dishes, working in the garden, and you're singing the liturgy. Yep. And so that begins to permeate your mind as opposed to whatever other random influence totally. thought can be dumped in there. Totally. And I think that we say, oh, well, you know, our ancient ancestors, they just did whatever their clergy told them because they, you know, were not as smart as we are. It's like, no, I actually think they understood a lot more about the way the human brain might yep. operate than we do because we believe ourselves to be so much more intelligent. That's, exact, that's Which, exactly right. Yep. Right, and there's, right. well, and even it's interesting, our, our understanding of memory, our entire legal system is based on an understanding of memory that science can't prop up anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Like, and so yeah. you've got a real, you got to, there's a whole lot of questions we have to ask ourselves as a society and not least of which in the church. I mean, in light, in evangelicalism has really been built on the back of a sort of rationalistic or, or maybe rationalist dualist view of the world when there's a lot of practices that are really practically good that we've mm-hmm. adopted as, as the church and our, but our reasons for doing them are often not. And that's, mm-hmm. that's part of the problem. So if you look at memory, for example, uh, we have thought of memory as kind of fixed. In other words, like, well, actually it's funny, funny, full circle. We think of memory often in terms of time. So it's like, oh, I remember February the 10th of 2010, right? Right. No, I don't remember that date, but that's not my point. Um, So we think of it that when in reality, memory reconstructs events based on Mm -hmm. sensory input. So if we want to learn a thing, few things are more effective than pairing it with a multi-sensory experience that is deeply emotional mm-hmm. yeah. because okay. our brain will rebuild a more accurate or at least a more vivid model of the thing we seek to remember than if we have simply accepted information through one or two senses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so this is where like the question of preaching as opposed to the homily. And I love a good sermon. That's not my point. It's just like there, there are a lot of things we're not tackling from what we're beginning to know about humanity. And interestingly, so often affirm many of the practices that church has had all along. And I, my hope would be in my own lifetime that we find ways to harmonize this within Protestant circles and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting about, you, you, you know, you, you've, you've mentioned repetition, and I think that that's fascinating to me because one of the things that Protestants get a little squeamish about when they hear the the phrase, but um, like centering prayer, rep, repetitive totally. prayer, which, which which in the charismatic tradition is praying in tongues, essentially. Um, oh, yeah. Doing yeah. it a different way. It's um, <laughs> Yeah. Man, manufactured flow state, which is what it always is, flow state. But it's, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, it, but it's interesting because, you know, we, we talk, there are people who talk badly about the music now and will go back to hymns without knowing that when hymns first got onto the scene, they, they were exactly were, they, the same. They were the same. They were, <laughs> they were hated just as much because they were these classic lyrics, maybe sometimes new lyrics put over bar, bar songs. You want to know what's so, even crazier shanties. than that? is that those were sold in hymn books by publishers who made all the money and kept it from many of the writers. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there wasn't a commercial interest in hymns. There was a huge commercial interest in hymns. It's Mm -hmm. that it was a much more unjust system. So if anything, the contemporary commercial approach to religious music is more just. So we have this sort of like spiritual, why there's a great example of this. They call it the Tiffany problem in yeah, in absolutely. movies have you heard of this yeah yeah where where the, the tiffany is a word that's from the 12th century but we assume that it's modern and a contemporary invention and so when tiffany is used in historical film people audiences are find it jarring and so they don't use the word the name tiffany in historical stories gladiator <laughs> has a great example of this where the movie gladiator applied the tiffany problem to scenes in the coliseum because The reality is Rome had billboards and graffiti everywhere. They had advertising like crazy. And we just find that uncomfortable because we idolize Rome as this pre-modern thing. And we think of advertising as a modern invention. And so they didn't include all the billboards for where to buy sweat in the Coliseum. (laughs) I mean, the Coliseum looked a lot more like an NHL arena, you know, Mm -hmm. with ads all around it. 
And hymns are the same of, way. We sort of look yeah. at history in rose-colored glasses. Yes. Yeah. I just, I, I was, you know, that made me think of, uh, did you watch the movie Hacksaw Ridge? No, I haven't seen it, no. Okay, so first off, it's a fantastic movie. Awesome. But what's, in, it may, the Tiffany problem makes me think of that movie because there were certain things that happened to Desmond Dawes that they didn't put in the movie because people would not believe them. Yep. Believe that they happened. Totally. And I find that, I find that so fascinating that there are things that we just, we cannot believe mm -hmm. even though they're true. Yeah. It's it, history is of human nature. Hasn't changed much. No. And I think back to your comments about the enlightenment, one of the mistakes we made in that sort of switch in the 17th and 18th centuries was this belief that we had changed the course of human history yeah. instead of seeing, Oh, this, that was re really the angle of the enlightenment. There were great things that happened in there, but it was really just great advertising. Mm -hmm. Like we, we convinced ourselves that we were a new kind of human instead of we the reborn. same kind. We were reborn as this, you know, enlightened race. Um, and we're even the very sciences that were kind of propagated by that pro positively, again, I say, um, are beginning to show that we're a lot more complex than, than we liked to believe. Um, and, 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 you know, there was, an, I think we, it's sort of, interesting in the way it relates to the Trinity too. I mean, we have this view of God as a complex mystery in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a paradox, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it, you know, and it comes to bear back to the question of holism on politics, on faith, on debates like this, where we often think of these things in really fixed kind of siloed ways. I had one theologian put it in a way that I thought was really remarkable. And he was talking about the Trinity and he was saying that, we have in the Trinity individuals, God, the father, God, the Holy spirit, God, the son in a social matrix from which the identities of each somewhat arise from the other while not being the other. Mm -hmm. That is a much more accurate way of looking at human personhood than the sort of radical individualism and hyper rationalism that we take for granted in the West as right. being what constitutes a person. The sciences are no longer looking like that's true. And that has all kinds of moral questions. And this is an area we don't need to get into, but like in terms of questions of identity and, and human nature and all, yeah. a long list of areas where we are currently having debates that I think in 50 years will be totally different than they are right now as sure. we evolve our understanding of the kind of interconnected. And I know this sounds pretty woo woo, but like the kind of interconnected nature of what it means to be a human in relationship to other humans in relationship to God in relationship to our own self and psyche. Well, and I, th I think that you, you mentioned earlier about the um, um, emotions and in how we kind of split ourselves apart in a mm -hmm. sense between rational and emotional. And I, I find that to be, you know, as I've read, as I've done different, uh, when, I, when I've learned different things, I keep coming to the conclusion that one of our biggest issues is that we're, um, we re reject thinking of ourselves and others and everything as holistic rather than individual, mm -hmm. because it's like people will talk about emotions as if they're bad. And mm -hmm. I've, I've said this before and you, you put some brain science to it, which is awesome. I always love when that happens. Um, but like I, I've, I've talked to people who've talked about their emotions as if they're evil. And I'm like, no, our emotions are telling us something and our rationality right. is trying to explain what that is. Yes. And yes. I, I, I think that our emotions are God given. I think mm -hmm. that these are good things and that we, we do need to pause and understand them. They're, they're and a signal. They, right. And it's, it, they're good, but it's in, it, 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 you know, Jessica mentioned earlier, uh, something about nature. And I always think it's funny because I'm sure she gets annoyed with me because every time we'll talk about like the fallen nature of humans or whatever, and she'll be like, you know, and it's, it's, it's human nature. And I'm always like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> because I'm like, no, that was not intended. That is, that is a corruption yes. within us rather than our nature. And so right. it, it's, it's, I, I love having these, like I'm having oxytocin all over the place talking to you right now. Um, but, uh, or whichever one dopamine's the, the dopamine's the reward the one, but me, yeah, 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 right. yeah great, yeah, <laughs> whatever. I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I'm a neither uh, am I. Uh, a, a, a guy who likes theology. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, but no, and that's that's what's so fascinating is we'll have these conversations, and I think that we miss out on who we are because we're trying to split ourselves up into these different areas when that's not how we're built. 
Oh, completely. All. And I think it, it even back to the kind of question of original sin, if you will, or or the fallen nature of reality. I mean, if we have to deal with the implications of a holistic theology on all fronts. Yeah. So if we're going to say that God's relationship to materiality is more complex and than we have traditional, or no, not even tradition, than we have, yeah. at least within Protestant circles, understood it to be, right? Because the Orthodox have a much better understanding of this um, yeah. through participation and, and their kind of view of, of that. Um, so the the idea that like God has this sort of working relationship with the material world also comes to bear in our understanding of sin. Yeah. And, and it, it sort of, while it doesn't, I don't think it ties up these big philosophical questions in a neat and tidy bow, it at least makes me a lot more comfortable with them than I was prior to sort of beginning to see, understand God in his relationship to metaphysics in this way. Um, where, look, like, if I'm broken at every level, none, nothing in my life is implicitly good. So, for example, however I'm born, I have an eye that's probably, I have a retina that's probably going to disconnect at some point in my life. It could be from a lot of bad hits in hockey, and it's some headers in soccer. More than likely, it's genetics. Was So what do I think that means about God? Does that mean that everything that happens in my life is implicitly God's will? Well, no. There's there are You can see in Scripture, in the course of Scripture, there are wills at play beyond yeah. God's, or the Lord's Prayer wouldn't be the way it is. Right. And so we have this idea that there is corruption at every level of the human life. And what we have in Jesus is a redeemed whole being, not an, a soul which has escaped the problems of corrupt flesh, not a corrupt soul which is sinful by nature. And so it, to me, it cleans up a lot of these things, um, or at least helps me categorize them in a way that makes them easier to talk about and and approach Christian history and tradition and thought with, you know? And it's, it's wild. One of the things I keep offhandedly mention mentioning, and it's something that I think needs a, an episode to talk about is how much Gnosticism mm -hmm. has entered into the common Christian dialect. Oh yeah. Like how much we view, you know, earth ourselves as evil and only the spiritual or the soul as good. And it's like, yes, this is a problem. Oh it's yeah, we should be talking about a hundred percent. Well, and and what's what's crazy about it is that like if you look, people will sometimes talk as though the early church viewed it differently, or Constantine broke everything, or there's all of these like really overly simplistic ways of tackling it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at the creeds, bodily resurrection was the function of the gospel. Mm -hmm. The outcome of the gospel was bodily resurrection. So there's if you look at the gospels, the tomb is empty for a reason. There's no need. For the stone to roll away if a spiritual resurrection is even the point at all. You look right. at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It, in most issues, Jesus was more like the Pharisees than the Sadducees. Um, yeah. You look at the question of Hellenism in Israel and Judaism, which just meant uh, becoming more Greek. Um, mm -hmm. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had both differing relationships to Hellenism and, and the, the nation of, of Israel and so on. But their debate between them about, about the afterlife was essentially, we die, and that's it. That's the Sadducees, yeah. right? Or our bodies come back in this promised land. That's yeah. the Pharisees. So there's no version of the sort of hyper-Hellenistic, which is really actually kind of Neoplatonism, which influenced yeah. Gnosticism. Um, which wasn't even what Plato was really arguing. Um, but there's there's not this sense in which like, oh, no, everything body, everything material bad, spirit good. The real, what's really real is the part we don't see. It yeah. seems clear in the gospel that what's really, and clear in Judaism at the very least, that they had inklings of the really real being, or, or what we see having some relationship to the really real. Yeah. Like when God created us and said it was very good, he mm -hmm. meant that. Yep, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, and, and it's, it's like that, those are kind of two things that I've, I've been frustrated about for a minute because I did deconstruct on hell mm -hmm. because it, I didn't even mean to, I yeah. didn't mean to change my mind on hell. Um, but that the, 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 intro, the, the Gnosticism and the, the Hellenization of Christianity has 
is I, I see some people say some things and I'm like, that's not Christianity, nor is it necessarily Judaism. It's just right. So do you feel like you're Greek. doing a, a deconstruction of a deconstruction? Um, like there, I, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. No. So it, what, it, okay. So let's talk about deconstruction for a second. Cause we sure. mentioned it briefly with um, our friend, Glenn peoples, who um, he's out of New Zealand, but he, he writes for rethinking hell and a couple of other uh, publications. And he's mm -hmm. a, he's a theologian. He's got a PhD, very smart. Um, but we, we, we talked about, cause I asked him what he thought about deconstruction because when I see it now, uh, it seems that the only outcome of deconstruction in the zeitgeist is leaving Christianity. So it's the retina links. It's not some, and it, and it seems like a lot of times when people talk about deconstruction, that means they start reading science books and they don't look at historic Christianity at all. They don't look right. at the old debates. They don't look at right. the old writings. They just right. look at what Carl Sagan said, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I love Carl and Sagan, so, by the way. Me too. I do as well. <laughs> I, I've never, I've never listened to anything by Carl Sagan. It's just great. the first name that came to mind. It's I, inspirational. I was of Christopher Hitchens, but you know, yeah. If, if yeah. you listen to any, just anybody who's listening or to you, Cam, if you listen to any one thing that he's done, listen to the pale blue dot. Yeah. Because yeah. That's that fit. beautiful. 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 Well, it's, it's interesting too. It surprises people that I like Sam Harris some of the time, <laughs> you know, this is a militant yeah. atheist. It's like, no, this is he a is reason. An he was the new atheism maker. guy, right? He's effective yes. at arguing. He's thoughtful. Um, he is trying to come about the metaphysical question backwards. That's my take. Yeah. And, well, and, well, and, yeah. I was just going to say he was the one who was at the forefront of the the kind of new new atheism idea of creating a church in a sense because people need that. Uh, you sort can't of. just dash it. Yeah, but, sort of. He he talks to the people that started that, but he's not. He's actually never been involved in that. Okay, I mean From atheism plus. Yeah, yes, yeah, that whole thing. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's a he's into transcendental meditation. And it's interesting that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm so no. It's just I, we don't need to. We don't need to sit on Sam Harris much, but um, <laughs> but the so the thing for deconstruction around deconstruction for me, um, and it's similar to other issues you know, like take critical race theory, for example, where we say a word and it is a loaded word where, because people like us do things like this, the word itself incites a reaction that is different from that person's actual convictions. Yeah. And so when we use the word deconstruction outside of the academic setting, where it is practically required that you define your terms, if we use it as a shorthand and won't define our terms, then we are absolutely inviting any emotional response that people will have to it. Yeah. I think you're totally right that the word has been lost to the zeitgeist because of use, where an academic term that once meant language, which I, I it's funny there are things I can never remember how to pronounce his name. Derrida. There are things within Derrida. 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 Yeah. There are things within Derrida that are seem to me obvious. Now I'm 39. I'm handsomely, handsomely postmodern <laughs> in a sense by default, <laughs> right? It's the ocean I was raised swam in. Um, but nevertheless, it seems a given that language exists between persons rather than, having an innate quality in and of itself, which is Derrida's big thing that led to the idea of deconstructionism, right? Mm -hmm. Is that language doesn't have fixed, words don't have fixed meaning. Duh. Right. Like that's yeah. kind of like that to me, I, I just can't see how you could conclude that words have concrete meanings. So there's something in that where it's like, yeah, we have to then say more than the words that we use in order to have a conversation like this. So right. deconstruction, the idea of taking something apart and putting it back, the idea of taking something apart, examining its parts in order to find meaning within the parts. That's discipleship 101. Yeah. That's, that's what are we doing? How are we becoming more like the thing which is true? The mm -hmm. question in deconstruction in terms of, the question really though is to what is that examination anchored? And yeah. I would think that for the believer, who seeks to speak from the inside rather than outside. And by that, I mean, speaks as a believer to believers, right? 
it would be fundamentally important that I know people are like, people understand that I'm with them, not against them, or mm -hmm. that I'm not mm -hmm. reacting against them. So I can totally understand why someone, where if deconstruction has come to mean, which is an if, but it's an if I believe, if deconstruction has come to mean someone leaving the faith, they're anchoring their epistemology to themselves or elsewhere, and they're saying, I'm rebuilding any belief system from scratch, from ground zero, I'm not going to give anything more weight than anything else, which is what, you know, John Steingard's a good example of that. Um, he's a really sweet guy, actually, um, that, you know, genuine convictions or hurt in the church, whatever the cause, yeah. people going, I'm going to rebuild this from scratch. If that's what the word has come to mean, then it's, it's lost all use mm. for believers talking to believers. When we can simply say, I'm re-examining idiosyncrasies within evangelicalism, but I love Jesus more than ever. I, I, there's, yeah. there's no, or, Hey, I have genuine questions about faith and philosophy, but I'm committed and I'm here and I'm working through them. And I have tough questions that I'd like to ask them. And, and whoever's interested in that, let's talk about that. Most people, I don't know very many Christians who would say no to the second group. Mm -hmm, I know right. practically none. I don't think I've met anybody who, if you describe the process is going to say, no, I, we can't be asking questions and talking about it. No. You know what I, you know what I just realized? What's that? It, with some of our different episodes, we are deconstructing a lot. On this. Yes. This is, a de is this a deconstruction podcast, Jessica? <laughs> because be. we keep examining <laughs> things. But no, it, it, like I, would, I wouldn't use that word necessarily. Right. And, it's, and, it's, and I started this process 18 years ago. I wouldn't have called it that. It's what I yeah. understood discipleship to be. Yeah. And, and that's how I view it as well. And so it's like, um, so when... When so with the health thing, I didn't have any at the at the first part of looking into what the Bible says about health. That's what I was doing. What does the Bible say about hell? And I I read some pieces, uh, some articles by s different other people. I read a book called um, "The Fire That Consumes" by Edward Fudge. Mm -hmm. um, I've 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 looked at some some different things, and I was like, okay, so how does this match up with the Bible? And I didn't have an emotional need to yep. do that. Yep. Because for, for me, it was the raised... four views on hell, which now I think is five views, but, um, that's a good book. I read that. Yeah. One as well. Four views. On, so Pinnock, I went to church with Pinnock. Oh, okay. He was at my church growing up. Yeah. Well, and it's so, it, it's wild, but I, I would, I wouldn't have called it deconstruction and I didn't have like, a, like I was raised in the church to believe that if God wanted a eternal conscious torment, that that is within his justice, that's within his his thing, and I don't need to question it. Mm -hmm. And so I I bought that full full on. I said, you know, I didn't have any emotional, like, oh, this is really bad. I should I should look and see and fix this in my mind. It was just I started reading and I was like, wow, this doesn't make any sense. And then those emotions started to follow. Because once yep. I start because when I was reading into these ideas, I started to see God more clearly. Yep. Yeah. And so, and so where, where I saw this idea that every, most everyone believes if you ask any person on the street, what hell is, they would tell you eternal conscious torment. Yeah, your, your soul goes fail. to Hades and spends its time there burning, but I, yeah. I, it's practically impossible to read that back onto Judaism. And that's right. one of the, one of the biggest issues. But the thing I found most fascinating, not, we don't want to probably spend too much time on this, but just when, uh, I read four views on hell and this was years and years and years ago. Um, and what was fascinating to me was that the argument which used the most scripture and harmonized scripture the most across from beginning to end was yeah. the annihilationist or conditionist view. You, yeah. you, you couldn't all essentially most of the kind of, defensible positions within evangelicalism on hell, which view it as eternal conscious torment or some other variation of it, were as as shallow as five or six verses with translation issues very often. And, and it's interesting to me too, that this is an area where Protestantism in reaction to Catholicism is unwittingly full-scale adopting the Hellenistic view that's prevalent within Catholicism when the Orthodox have never even taken that entire structuring of the afterlife for granted. Yeah. And, and so to me that that's a really, that should temper our conviction in terms of like, Oh, it's definitely, well, you know, this is a question that the Bible says less about than we'd like to think it does.
Correct. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I think that's probably something that, you know, we all need to take for granted. And I, and I think, you know, in broader terms with the kind of question of deconstruction, um, it's the same sort of thing where it's like, you've got a John Cooper out there yelling the word at people and accomplishing nothing. John John Cooper's the lead singer of Skillet. Yes, that's Christian the guy. Band, by the way, Jessica. Yes, it's, I was like, he's he's <laughs> he's using this moment to his advantage. I just think it's gross to tell you the truth. Um, and he, I think he's well-meaning. He's a nice guy. Like he means well by it. Um, but it's it's just unfortunate. Like no, there are a lot of evangelicals who would, if given space, if given the space to ask questions of the text, of tradition, of history, and of themselves within the confines of a church comfortably conclude that they love Jesus and they're faithful to the church and they might just not be in the right lane. There are plenty of those people who, by circumstance of our kind of fear of philosophy and asking questions, uh, are, feel instead forced to jump ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's the sad thing is, you know, like the, I, I used to watch Rhett and Link with my kids all the time. Yeah. And then at the end of one of the episodes, they were like, here's a, you should listen to our podcast about how we left Christianity. And I was like, I don't think I will. Yeah. <laughs> Not today. Yeah. <laughs> that, that makes me sad. And I think that a lot of times the, the problems with deconstruction is a lot of people do use it to mean I am shedding Christianity. Yes. Pure and simple. And then a lot, a, a lot of other people go into it very well-meaning. Uh, but they don't have, they they don't have the necessarily the arguments to read or the the tradition or they don't they don't have the tools to do it. Yep. And on top of that, they don't have the accountability that mm -hmm. you need when you're entering into this space. Like yep. I, when I started talking, thinking about hell, for instance, um, also the the book Four Views of Atonement, fascinating. Yeah. I don't know if you totally read that fascinating. One. Yep, I have. Um, I, I landed on kaleidoscopic, but I think it's. I think it's fascinating, but I don't think the first thing I did was I started talking to other Christians mm -hmm. about it and about, you know, these arguments where they came from the, and I, I had this dialogue I had, I was, I didn't have necessarily a mentor to be discipled by when I was going through this, but I did, I didn't have a lot of, um, let's use a Bible. Uh, I didn't have a lot of Nathans, but I had tons of Jonathans to talk things mm -hmm. over with. Mm -hmm. So I had, I had tons of friends that were peers that I could go, okay, so this is what I don't see. How am I right or wrong? And the, we all were in different spaces with different por portions of each uh, idea, but we were all able to be like, well, you know, I love you. Let's, you want to get some pizza? And that was, totally. it was comfortable. And yeah. I think that that's a part of it is there is a, there's a drive for membership or decision over discipleship. Yes. In most mm -hmm. churches. Yes. And I, and I think for, for me, I had the gift of my first worship leader position in the early two thousands being at a church alongside somebody who had, I'd, I'd been raised sort of in a very admittedly heavy handed, but sincere, uh, pursuit of, you know, live, live like you see Christ as, you know, yeah. that's, that's fundamental, you know, and yeah. if it's going to involve the Holy spirit in some way, and there were some toxic things with that, but by and large, a conviction to be convicted, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and then, in the, and then I walked into a church shortly thereafter alongside a pastor who, and we didn't end well, although we're friends now, um, acquaintances at least. Uh, but it, it, uh, you know, someone who'd come out of a think tank with Sylvia Keys, Walsh and Keys, Matt, and kind of this sort of conversational high level theology and philosophy was kind of baked into the church staff culture. Um, and so it was just this great, and alongside a city grappling very deeply with, at least within Protestant circles, the ecumenical question. So, so there's sort of this like real, I was just it, by default and we were commissioned by that movement, literally sent off by 20 churches. Very weird. So it's like, yeah. so we're going out into the world and I'm going, I don't feel equipped for this. I have to really learn quickly how the world looks at this. I got into Robert Weber, got into reading Eastern Orthodoxy, reading Catholicism, reading Anglicism, reading Church Fathers. And this was, you know, 20 years ago. So, so this was kind of like the milieu that I was in, the soup I was in. And so I'm really grateful for that now. But, but I'll tell you, for, the, for a long time, I felt like an alien as we were traveling mm, yeah. and, and playing churches in American evangelicalism. And I don't know the degree to which people outside my band realized how out of place I felt, even though I was kind of part of it all. And I, 
And, and, I, and I think, sort of like you were saying earlier, we have this tendency to moralize and judge these types of things as if they are simple questions. And a big part of this, to me, a big part of one of my core convictions is we need to allow room for the belief that complica- complex questions might have complex answers yes. and, and, or might not be answerable at all because we don't know what we don't know. And right. so if we're not comfortable with that within the church, if the scientific community is often uncomfortable with that in yes. their, in their public's facing scientists are usually very comfortable with that. You, you, you meet a scientist who's like, Oh yeah, we don't have any idea. Aliens, who knows? Like that's, <laughs> you know, very, very much a conversation that's there, but like the public face of science, even if it isn't acknowledging it is as the new societal priesthood. And, and so you can't afford not to have answers. So all of us, in a sense, need a dose of gentleness and humility in the way that they, we approach these things so that we can be kinder and more Christ-like and bear the fruit of the Spirit in these conversations. Yeah. It's well, and not very- to go too Greek, but one of the things that I learned from a Greek uh, was from Socrates, and it's kind of the 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 basement of how I approach things I and re- reconstructing or I'm yeah. talking to people about or whatever, which is yeah. the Socratic, all that I know is that I know nothing. And it, it applies explicitly to God mm-hmm. because he is, ab- there's no way for me to know it that's all. Right. So if I think that that's, I think you're right. I think humility is at the heart of these conversations. And I think that most people are incapable or I, I don't know if that, that seems a little judgy, but you know what I mean? Well, like, I, do, I do. It doesn't, they don't seem to be capable. I think there's a heavy reliance in our culture on rationalism because we are sort of like the children of that whole enlightenment movement, like Mm -hmm. you were talking about earlier. And there's layers to that. It's not only just the enlightenment, it's this whole um, rejection of tradition, um, rejection of the Catholic church that influenced so much of the way Western Christianity, American Christianity developed. And because of that, there were kernels of things that were good that you know, maybe perhaps the, you know, to my own horn here that the Orthodox had held on to that get rejected as um, Catholicism, get mm-hmm. je- rejected as sort of a uh, automaton traditionalism that we have no use for. We don't know why we're doing it. So let's not do it at all. Yep. Yep. And as a result, we have to or are forced to come up with these sort of rationally based explanations for things that don't have rational explanations to begin with. And that can cause a lot of, I think, turmoil, especially when we acknowledge on some level there isn't a rational explanation. And to be comfortable, okay, and peaceful with that idea is an anathema to the post-enlightenment uh, culture that we live in. Well, and that's that's spot on. And that's one of the reasons that I find the sciences around human behavior, around phenomenon like singing, so fascinating. Because it was crucial to me in reconstructing worship in a sense of understanding right. what it is that we do and why we do it and why I'm still a fan of contemporary worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing I'm uh, opposed to in the way that we do it is the way that we talk about it. It's really an attribution bias. Yeah. So that's that's the most problematic part. It's what I call borrowed authority. Instead of humbly saying, this, this it feels incredible to sing together and the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts and lives. Huh? No, no question for me. Great. Let's go there. What we often do is instead say, see that tingle, that thing you feel, that means the Holy Spirit is here and not somewhere else. Yeah. Or that means that the Holy Spirit is doing. So like I said, then that person goes to Coldplay, has the same sensation and says, God's not real. They're full of crap. Or say, or they're led to say, God is here. The church is useless. When and it's the church's own doing. We we sort of take that binary break apart thing for granted. And I just it's like you were saying, we kind of need to just have these more, hey, wait a minute. How do we come to how do we come to the positions that we came to? How did we get here? And in in what ways have we, you know, uncritically said that there well, and I guess the thing for me is that like we are beginning to see answers take take shape. We are beginning to see in the sciences that some of these things that we thought were purposeless were actually mm-hmm. quite smart things to do right. in the, in the grand scheme of human wisdom. I mean, and, and I, and everyone comfortably, everyone in the West, not everyone, but many people in the West comfortably look at Buddhist wisdom with 
kindness and curiosity. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Why do we think that all of the wisdom within the within the practice, the very sound practice of meditation in a sense, right? Why do we think that meditative practice over there is inherently good when that is up until Protestant Reformation, that is kind of how many people viewed prayer in Christian circles as well. Meditative prayer was very normal. Yeah. And, you know, axiomatic prayer, very common in liturgy and in, in the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Yeah. So, I mean, Taizé is that right. yeah. mixed with music. So you, we just sort of, honestly, so much of this comes down, can't, this might be a response to what you were saying, the brain preserves energy. Yeah. It is a lazy machine. Mm -hmm. And if it can grab onto an explanation very quickly that reduces the use of sugars in yeah. order to, in order to answer as many questions as it can in as short a time as it can, it will. Right. Yeah. And, when, and, I think and that's weird, kind of at the center of so much of this. Yeah. I think that there's this weird conflict within us as well with, after post enlightenment where we have to, we feel like we have to reason everything and we can't yes. take things prima, prima facie. We can't take things on their face. Mm -hmm. I think that there is, and I think it goes back to, you know, Genesis three, where we are uncomfortable with rest. We're mm -hmm. we, 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 we are used to toil. We are used to either being a slaves to the land or the, the land being slave enslaved to us. And so I think that there, I think that does come into philosophy where, you know, there are things that we can see that are, if you're not being lazy if you accept it because you can see it. Mm -hmm. So the, the goodness of um, music mm -hmm. and worship, you can feel it. You, you know that, that this is, this is something that is good and you, you don't, it's good to understand why, but it, at the same time with any number of other things, there are things that are true. Yep. On its face. Yep. And I think there are a lot of people who are very uncomfortable because they can't, they see something that they know or feel to be true. And I think this is a problem with a lot of people who are outside of faith where they see something that they see it as true, but they can't explain it. So they, they won't let themselves believe it. Right. That right. makes sense, yeah. Jessica. Yes, it does. There's, um, you know, a part of your brain that you will have to grapple with where, when you decide on faith, because there's a moment of decision. Mm -hmm. Where you decide, I'm going to choose to believe something that I can't necessarily prove. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that you can compartmentalize that part of yourself for a while. You keep that in its own separate little space. Then from, you know, for example, I was a um, biology major. I, I guess I still technically am. I've <laughs> been out of school for mm -hmm. a while, though, um, mm -hmm. where I was starting to have feelings um, toward faith toward the idea that God might exist. Biology will do that to you. Completely anathema to what the world I had, the worldview I had constructed previously, yeah. which was completely scientific, secular, and atheist on every level. And as you said, as you start to study biology and there become these sort of creepy little gray areas that seem ex overly explained down to the um, the minutia of the way the atoms behave in interaction or, or with one another. Bizar bizarrely consistent right. phenomenon from the Bizarre atom all the way up to, yeah. Right, right. Like when you see these pictures of how like um, the shape of a tree mimics the shape of your bronchial systems and yeah. you know things of this nature. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I could go on and on yeah, with examples yeah, of things yeah. like that, but it's, it's our need, our... Um, need as an animal to have these really easily compartmentalized constructions that we can, as you said, use the least amount of sugars mm -hmm. to uh, fit into our worldview. Mm -hmm. And it becomes actually physically painful when something comes along that, although it might have more truth, more rational explanation behind it, upsets your set of worldviews. Yep. And so you will fight like some people to the point of physical altercation yes. in order to preserve the easily digestible construction that you have yes, in front of you. Totally. So well, it's, yeah. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. And that's I, so it's funny. Like I, given that I'm a person who often gets into the technical weeds and I mean, partly I see it, I see my mission, if you will, even within the context of worship to, to shape the conversation differently because yeah many of these scientific questions or theological questions or historical questions would have for me, had I not been in the environment I was in, absolutely. They would have, I'm, I'm smart enough and geeky enough that had I not had room to ask 
and arrogant enough, had I not had room to ask questions yes, and have, and had, then I would have absolutely left the faith. Right. No question. No question. 1000%. Same here. And, and so like for me, I was given that room and that meant that I, you know, was able to harmonize given enough time, harmonize some of these things. Um, and so, I, you know, I, that's why it all to me, um, within evangelicalism, within orthodoxy, whatever, Jesus boils it down in Matthew 22 to the Shema. Yep. And the Shema is love the Lord, your God with all your, all, all your, all, all your, all, and all your, all. And then we <laughs> yep. trans, we translate those to mean different things, of course, because it's more helpful, but, <laughs> but, but <laughs> like love God with everything. So on some level, that means no God. It, it means know what can be known about God relate to God as a person. I mean, we think of pistis in Greek as faithfulness rather than faith as being assenting to, you know, belief. We think of faith in the West as belief, whereas the Greek word meant something more like trusting in. It was relational, yeah. right? So right. there's, there's right. that side of it. And then, so there's, there's a sense in which like Jesus does reduce faith to a fairly simple axiom, Give God, love God with everything, desire, love, want, have affinity for and affection for God in every area of your life. And if you're doing that, you will also love your neighbor as you love yourself. You will mm -hmm. act selflessly and be at one and comfortable with yourself. Within Protestantism, we've reduced it mostly to know the gospel, know a version of the gospel with your mind. And by, yeah. by means of that, Know, about, know enough about God to persuade people of this version of the gospel. Right. When discipleship is fundamentally a heart, behavior, social, and intellectual question. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and we, we just have not, we've, we've adapted and adopted all of it into this sort of same Western framework that we use for everything, which is to make it minuscule and manageable and yeah. and knowable in in a broad sense. And so yeah, I mean I I don't feel like I'm being all that mystical about it and I don't feel like you guys are either. But it is remarkable to me we're saying, "Hey, I'm deeply in the confines of Christian orthodoxy within the grand scheme of history. I am absolutely committed and convicted that Jesus is Lord over the whole universe and my own life, and I'm going to try my best to live accordingly." Um, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. And I'm going to look to the fruit of the Spirit in my life, mm -hmm. not simply a few experiences that may or that in some cases are beyond my explanation and in some cases are easily a con man on fire. You know, like it, it right. th those things this is, happen. This is something that um, within the Orthodox Church, why um, it, a, almost a severe level of sobriety is, mm. is recommended because spiritual ecstasies, Yep. can is easily be turned can be experiences that you receive from like you said a cold play concert. Yeah. And so when we don't have a sort of like a sober attitude about the way that our brain might um interpret the experiences of the world around us, we can very easily fall victim to our own hubris or other kinds of influences. Yeah. And so you have to have this sort of like strict sobriety, even it, when it comes to that tingly feeling that you yeah. get when you listen to worship music. Yeah. And I would, I would say there's an asceticism to uh, orthodoxy that I, that is probably further than I would go with it, but I do appreciate. Um, and, right. and, and that is, that is that sense of like, yeah, we should, we should look at the broad human question when we mm -hmm. interpret stimuli and experiences. Um, right. I, I would just look at it a little more redemptively in terms of, I think it's okay to say, hey, this is a beautiful experience that we're having. Oh, oh sure. And I, I wouldn't say that I find orthodoxy to be um, uh, unwilling oh, yeah, to yeah. accept those experiences, but in terms of like our spiritual nature, right. like to just to, to have a really sober mind about yes. the way that your body and your mind works, yes. so that when you are in the midst of these very emotional types of experiences, that you're not attributing to them, them to things that they don't necessarily belong to. Right. Yeah. And, we, we, and to moralize those experiences is implicit, uh, to moralize the giver of those experiences is implicitly good because of the experience is often right. what people do. It's sort of an attribution yeah. thing, um, which, and, and, and that's frankly, not to close full circle here, but that's that's probably the at the heart of the issues around, say, Hillsong or Bethel or that sort of thing. It isn't any of the actual practice. I mean, some of the practices, but very few of them. It's in 
how do we talk about what these mean mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and how we relate to one another and the people delivering them as a result. As a worship leader, I am out here saying I am not more special than a Christian dentist. Yeah. I, I am up there saying I am not God's lightning rod in the room. I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a servant. I'm looking at the back of the room and I'm saying, what is Why is that guy out of it? How do I get that guy to care? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my, it's a practical extra biblical role. I'm not a Levite. The state does not pay me to do what I do. Um, well, actually in Canada they do thanks to some of their grant systems, but, um, that's a different problem. Um, I think Canada would be uncomfortable with thinking that they're granting Levites, but, uh, like there, it's just the reality of the ways that we try to talk about worship leading um, are, are on such thin ice biblically. And it's like, hey, no, this is a useful, practical thing that arises from tradition by which we can use these useful tools in music and understanding of people and in scripture to lead people in transformative corporate prayer. And right. God can use the physiology of the human body in powerful ways. And the Holy Spirit can even point our attention to what he's doing in our lives by those physiological mechanisms. And all of that is good. And therefore, no one can look at me and say, you're God's spokesperson because I felt yeah. this way. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. I'm an amateur. I don't know what I'm yeah. doing. You know? <laughs> Same here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, one of the things that I, I keep thinking since what, as y'all were talking was, I think that maybe one of the, the most useful practices I've had as a Christian in order to know God more, to know Jesus more. I think that spiritual reading out with the Bible and outside the Bible is very important, but I think maybe one of the most freeing things that I did was I learned how to rest in mystery. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to work the mysteries out. There are mysteries and I can't, I know I can't figure it out, figure yep. them out. I know I can't make a perfect analogy for the Trinity. Yep. I, I know that, you know, if I misstep here or there, I'm kind of blaspheming. <laughs> so let's not try to do that too much. Right. <laughs> right. right. This is why we had um, so many, so many odd ecumenical councils had to be called because yeah. somebody overly tried to overly rationalize what the Trinity was. It caused right. so many problems in the church to do that. Totally. Like, why can't we just accept this is a mystery? Your brain was not built to understand this. Oh, like, totally. I'm well, fine with that. Well, and just to draw <laughs> back to what I was saying earlier, though, within that, that doesn't mean there aren't interesting or meaningful principles that we can extract from that and say, what does that say? So like when we talk about being made in the image of God, I mean, we could talk about the cosmology of the universe and the idea that we are essentially Athena in the temple of Athena. Um, we are the representation of God and vocational bearers of God's image. It is our job to be like God in the world, right? So if that's sort of the fundamental thing that's happening in Genesis 1, well, then that also brings Trinity to bear on the question of our nature. Yeah. What does it mean that God is mysterious enough and complex enough, his relationship between his creation, between his creating, creating self, his willful self, his embodied self, his emotions in Jesus, the Holy Spirit in the sense of the immaterial. Well, this is one and three, right? Now, I'm not trying to be heretical and saying this is what humans are, but it's at the very least a good analogy for like, hey, we're a lot more complicated than, mm -hmm. than we like to pretend we are. And then even then our brain sort of likes to tell us that we are. And there's a lot to be gained by taking that mystery and approaching ourselves with the same humility. Um, and curiosity more than conquering, I think, is really right. the really the thing that comes comes to mind there. Right. I think I think that the, that's what I I mention spiritual reading is because um, I I love the mystery. I love uncovering little pieces that are uncoverable. I love um, tearing down misconceptions that I've had. I love mm -hmm. all of these things, but not at the um, not to to violate the truth. Mm -hmm. Like once I, once I start violating the truth, I can, I, I, not to be too touchy feely. I can feel but, it. No. Yeah. But there, so there's something that I've been told by actually multiple priests within the Orthodox church, which is when you have a dream or a spiritual ecstasy type of experience where you're getting that feeling crying, or you have a dream that really affects you. Um, 
we're urged to, to kind of like lay that aside and to not read too much into these experiences on our own because we are actually not equipped all the way to fully interpret them. Right. And so if an experience, um, if a dream does come from the Holy Spirit, does come from God, that's not going to stop. That one dream, you don't interpret it the right, right way. Well, you've lost your chance out at whatever was trying to be communicated to you. Absolutely not. Will come. Yeah. The confirmation will come. And so don't sit there and, you know, go over, do postmortem of every little spiritual experience you've ever had or every yep. dream you've ever had because you just simply lack the tools. Totally. And things will be revealed to you in the order and time in which you can receive them, which you mm -hmm. can bear them, mm -hmm. and in which you can incorporate them into your life. Totally. And so that, to me, everything that you guys just were talking about really like crystallized that kind of idea, which has been iterated to me by many priests and now has come to make a full kind of sense in a way. Like, I just don't have the tools for this and mm -hmm. I yeah. need to be okay with that. Yeah. And God, God works in the long haul, mm -hmm. typically mm -hmm. it seems to, and God is ha more than happy to use systems we have to his purposes. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, that's sort of why I think all of this ends up stemming from that metaphysical question. It's like, what do we think yeah. God, what do we think God's relationship to us is and to the world and to the body? And, and if we can get comfortable, at least with the idea that it's, it's not zero, then yeah. it can, it can help make a lot of peace in some of these areas. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, really do at some point maybe we'll we'll do another episode if you're interested in that i want sure. to talk about the toronto blessing at some point and kind of get sure some yeah stuff because i grew up in that world i went when when i was growing up I'm, I'm a little younger than you um the big thing for us was the brownsville revival mm -hmm. yeah and and then um when i when i went to college i went to college in in central florida as well and there was the the todd bentley i don't know if you mm -hmm. know about that i know todd Oh, I don't know, know him personally, but I know who he okay. is. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was about to say. I, I know quite I a few people him. who know him personally, but. Um, yeah, it, I, I was, and, and that was one of those that like, I was here for that and I didn't go because I didn't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. I, 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 so here's the thing there. Toronto was a little chaotic at times. Yeah. Um, it was also very fruitful in my own life. Yeah. And, and that's a strange thing. Hmm. To like to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'll say this: yeah. um, there is less of an inclination, not not none. It's not no inclination, but less of an inclination in the Canadian environment, largely post-Christian, to commercialize things like that. Yeah. So there was an innocence to John and Carol are not from Toronto, um, and their sort of hesitancy or at least like the sort of commercialism that happens in the States. Yeah. The sort of empire building that happens in the States, particularly now around some of the larger, well, we, I, I won't say it, but we all know um, uh, that even though those are things that came, these are people who went to Toronto, had an experience in Toronto. And then and I think it's really interesting to notice the difference between Nikki Gumbel and some of the things that have happened in the States yeah. where you, we have, we have alpha, we have HTB, we have church planting. We have the, frankly, the, the redeeming of multiple Anglican buildings and churches in, in cities across the UK, because a, a guy, a vicar came to Toronto. And then in the States we have huge publishing commercial empires and huge, like there's, it, yeah. there's a different commercial, a different attitude I'm not against commercialization. I run a marketing agency. Right. It's just, it's just like, what, what is our relationship between these things and how do they play and how does, which, what's wagging the tail or the dog? Right. You know? And I think that's, <laughs> Oh, Hey, lovely. Um, that, that, that to me is sort of the important question. Um, yeah. And I, I appreciate as there were things that I would have done very differently and would question if I were to hang out with John and Carol now, um, there was an innocence and a naivete about what was going on in Toronto that is unlike the atmosphere I've sensed and attitudes I've heard from people involved in movement in certain movements since. Yeah. Um, and, and it sort of brings to mind that Taylor dog, dog or tail, Taylor yeah. dog question. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, no, if, if you're ever willing to talk in, or even we can actually have a conversation offline, I'd love to talk to you about that. Sure. Um, yeah. Great. But we're getting close to two hours and I'm sure you have other things to do today. So uh, one of the things we do uh, at the end of every one of our shows is I don't yeah. know if you've noticed this, but over the last two years, people have been supremely depressed or affected by all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a wild two years, but we, we decided when we rebranded uh, to the mad ones that um, we were going to push for hope. Mm. And, and typically I, when I say hope, I mean it far more biblically than a lot of other people might hear it as, sure. um, but um we like to ask, we like to push that. So the last question we ask everyone is um, what's something right now in your life, beyond you, globally, whatever, whichever level you want to go, um, that gives you the hope and the motivation to carry on? Yeah. In the last few months, I've made some incredible friendships, which are often home to incredible conversations much like this and you know a little church with people who are are there for good reasons and sincere in their pursuit of jesus despite sometimes some of the things that they were told about him yeah and uh it gives me hope that you know that churches exist and that people exist who are in this for the reason of wanting to live in Jesus and in a Christ-like life. And I know that sounds really overly simple, um, but friendship and conversation and community in and around the person of Jesus is fundamental to my life. Yeah. Um, and as, as simple as a cup of coffee or a beer with the right group of people who have the right questions. And I do right. believe, I do believe we need to participate in church, in the church in a wider sense. I don't think we can eschew I mean, I think it's silly to eschew institutionalism as a thing. I, we, humans institutionalize everything. How, how are we going to do that exactly? Um, but you know, any any group of friends can become an institution. But but the the I have found such hope, honestly, in some of these friendships that have, have really, really borne incredible fruit in my life in the last year specifically. That's been been an absolute gift. Yes. Each Sorry. other is the best thing we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I mean, that's I mean, doing the show with with Jessica rather than by myself. It's been huge for me. We did. Yeah. We have an online Bible study that we do. Mm -hmm. That's been great. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I fully agree with all of that. Um, but before we let you, by the way, thank you for coming on. Like I said, I was excited to have you on. And if you're ever willing to do it again, I I want to do it again. Dude, yeah, been, I love it. It's been great. Um, but I want to let people know where to find you. And what, yes, I love when people have cross platform, um, like everything's the same. I, love, I used to have that until I lost my Twitter account mm. for making a joke that some, some people didn't really like. I'm right. rough around the edges. Um, but <laughs> if, if people want to find you, you're on oh. TikTok, Twitter and Instagram at Elias Dummer. And I'll spell that so you don't put a B in there. E-L-I-A-S-D-U-M-M-E-R. Um, you can also check out his, his music and everything that he's doing over at EliasDummer.com. And, uh, you have your solo album, the work volume one already out on all streaming yes. services. So just search for Elias Dummer for that. And you're, you, it looks like you're trickling out songs from the work volume two. The volume two will be out sometime in the next two months. Like it's, it's ready to go. So it's, uh, we're tying down the masters and then off we go. Nice. And like I said, check out the, the song Curie Eliason. Banger. Absolute Thank banger. Yeah. I, the, the tweet that I wrote that when I was listening to that was um, uh, wanting mercy for yourself is normal. Uh, wanting mercy for your enemies is Christ-like. Boom. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, I don't, I don't think I have it to do. What do you want to tell anyone else? tell them no, anywhere that's, else that's, to find you. That's, that's great. I mean, if you, if you like the music and you want free chord charts or anything, um, you can go to eliasdummer.com and then you'll find a subscription tool there. Uh, the thing I recommend above all else, honestly, is get on the mailing list. I love to share books I'm reading and, and stuff like that too. But TikTok, I'm enjoying TikTok a lot these days. So it's yeah. been a lot of fun. I've, I've, I've enjoyed it because it's, it, it, I, 
when I'm scrolling through TikTok, I'll get a lot of weird stuff and then I'll get occasional theology stuff. And it's like nine out of 10 times when it's a the, the, it's theological, it's like the person I don't want to listen to talking about it. You know what I mean? Like you can tell that they're very, they very much like themselves yeah, sure. more than they do the material sometimes. Yeah. But I, I, I see your face and I'm like, oh, this will be interesting. I'll stop. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so. That's, that's such a gift. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, th- like I said, thank you so much. And we'll pull you off the screen and tell everyone what else is coming up in the future. And thank you guys. If you, if you want to hang out in the, and talk for a second afterwards, feel free to do so. Awesome. I'll, I'll do this number now. It was a true pleasure. Thank you. Thanks guys. This was fun. Thank you. See ya. All right. So for the rest of you, um, next week we have our friend Cody cook and his friend, John D'Angelo coming on. Um, there have been a lot of people on Twitter and on Facebook Um, that are reacting to the current world and the current zeitgeist and seeing fellow human beings as enemies to be destroyed rather than enemies to be loved. And this has gotten under my skin. So um, I I want to, and and within circles Jessica and I used to be in, it's very prevalent. And I felt like we needed to speak into that. And so Cody and John are going to come on and we're going to talk about enemy love. We're going to talk about what it looked like historically and what it would look like today and how we can actually love our enemies like Jesus told us to. Um, beyond that, if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Ham Carlos. Jessica's on Twitter at Soup Canarchist. Um, if you want to watch these early and be a part of our little gaggle of people, you can go to patreon.com slash the mad ones. Join there and get a shirt at wearethemadones.com slash store. Uh, if you're watching, you can listen on any podcatcher or at wearethemadones.com. Um, if you are listening and would rather watch, we always have the episode premiere or be live 8.30 p.m. Eastern time um, every Wednesday. So you can join us there. If you don't like YouTube and you want some other options, we are also on Rockfin and Odyssey. But that's it. That's all I've got. Got anything for the people? No, just uh, if you guys are watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, smash the like button. Just help us get bumped up in that and share us with your friends. Yeah. (laughs) so beyond that uh, as always you have a chance to be a light in the world so go light it up